Good morning. Good morning. I imagine we have some more trickling. Hey, I don't know how it is for you. I feel like I'm preaching an hour too early right now. <laughs> so uh, it's good to be here with you this morning. I'm just thinking of so much. Here's, here's what I want to say is God loves you. He cares about you. He knows about your situation. He knows what you're going through. I'm doing this because I'm hitting everybody, all right? He knows everybody's got something going on, all right? And the good thing is he came to be with us. We're going to talk about that this morning. 2,000 years ago, right, he came to be with us. Why did he do that? He cares about us. About lost it right up there, seeing a dad baptizing this little girl. That's what it's supposed to be about. And then another man baptizing his co-worker that he shared the gospel with. That's what it's about. That's what we do. I met, I ran into a guy this week, and he says, well, how's the, mission, how's the missions going at the church? I knew what he was talking about because he, he, was, he was really asking me about the Dominican Republic, but, but that's like in July. And, I, and he asked me, I'm like, well, 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 right now we got a couple of guys in Trinidad and, and another guy's in Ohio checking out an opportunity for us in North American mission. I said, oh, yeah, we got some guys going Saturday in Guatemala. I'm like, well, I guess, you know, if you just keep doing the little things you're doing, all of a sudden you wake up one day and you're like, we're all over the place. Thank you for your faithfulness. You're just doing, I, I'm, I really shouldn't thank you. You're just doing what you're supposed to be doing, right? But I'm going to thank you anyway, so. Uh, let's pray. God, I just pray that you would speak to us this morning plainly and clearly from your word, God. I thank you that you are doing all these things around us, God. Thank you for letting us be a part of it and just play our little role in that, God. I pray that you'd help us to just be faithful in the things that you put right in front of us. And then when you tell us to look out, we look out and we go wherever that is, Lord. I pray somebody I know this morning needs some encouragement. Somebody needs some calm put into them. Someone needs to be, yeah, they need to be pushed a little bit. I pray, God, that you do all that through the same message and just the way you do it. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So welcome. If you're new to our church, we're going through the Gospel of John right now, and we uh, will almost finish chapter one today. Uh, so... Um, I just want to say, God, God wants to be known. He wants, he wants to be known. He's not hiding. Uh, he desires a relationship with us. So he doesn't just want to be known for being known's sake. He wants to be known so you know him and so you can have a relationship with him, right? You don't have a relationship with somebody you don't know. Make sense? All right. So he wants to be known. So, so years before he came, and we talked about Jesus coming in tabernacle uh, among us, and he is God, and Jesus is God. That's what the message was about last week. So years before he came to tabernacle, pitch his tent, move into our neighborhood, live with us, all that, but years before he did that, he had it written down. There was written down in the Old Testament. We have prophets write stuff down. So when he came, people would know that he was coming. So then he's writing it down. He has these people write, his people, Hebrew people, Jewish people, these people writing it down so they would know. So, so naturally, when it is time for him to arrive, his people would be the people reading the book that he had them write so that they would be looking for him. Signs of the times, okay, maybe. Maybe, just like today, we're looking, we see some stuff, right? We see, oh, he's coming back soon, right? This is crazy. I mean, look, don't get all, please, I know some of y'all do, don't get up, call up and all that conspiracy crap. It is a conspiracy. It's happening. It's all going to come together in the end. There's a reason that things are coming digitally. You know it. I, we were riding in our car yesterday, and I said, you know, they have technology now. They could cut this car off. They want to, right? It's out there. Get over it. Right? Don't waste no time. Get out there sharing the gospel because it's coming. So these people would read these things and see, and so the Jews are on the lookout, and they had the, the religious Jews, the chief priests, the scribes, and Pharisees, all of them, they were supposed to know the book, and so they're supposed to recognize the one to come from Deuteronomy 18, 18 when he came. And so they're on the lookout. So when something gets stirred up, 
they're like, go check this out. Maybe this is the one, right? And so this is where we're at. So we see then that as time came along, Jesus uh, or God sends John the Baptist to tell them he's here. All right? That's what it's about. That's what John the Baptist is coming to tell him about. I mean, what? I'm just thinking, what more do we want? Write it down in the book. Tell them to be on the lookout. And it, oh, we'll send a guy to say, he's here. What do we want? And then, I'm just getting ahead of the game. They, right? And I'm just going to tell you today, if you're here, and you're, it doesn't matter if you're a Jew or not, but if you don't believe them, if you missed them, it's your own dang fault. I'm just telling you, because it's here. And if you're so stubborn that you won't look it up and read it, then that's on you. Jeff and them went to Trinidad and sharing the gospel. There were people that said, eh, I don't want to hear it. I'm just saying, you'll listen to everything else. Listen to the gospel. All right, that's the sermon for the sermon. Okay. John the Baptist's primary duty is to be a witness. At this point, we leave the opening of the Gospel of John and begin a long section that runs all the way to the end of chapter 12. And the, the long section gathers testimony for Jesus as the Son of God. So he's stacking up testimony after testimony. He's piling the evidence on so that you know that Jesus is God. That's what John is doing. He's just, right now, he's just gathering the evidence. He's stacking it up so that, you know what, John 21, 31. John 20, 31, he says, I'm, I wrote all these things so that you believe. That I'm telling you at the end. I'm giving it away. I'm giving the story away, all right? So this, this long section gathers testimony for Jesus as the Son of God, the one in whom all should believe is what he says. And the word translated, the Greek word translated witness, Martyro uh, is used three times in Mark. It's used one time in Luke, and John uses that word witness 14 times. So he's all about that, see? So John the apostle wants to make sure folks know that Jesus is God. So he pursues firsthand witnesses, and the one known as John the Baptist is on the witness list. He's on the witness list. He was one of the first witnesses. If you go back to when he did a somersault in his mother's womb. Yeah. Luke, for one, Luke 1, 41. But as we progress to a grown-up John, we see an unmistakable character with a challenging message. And we look in, John, uh, we look in uh, Matthew 3, 4 through 9, actually right here. Now, John wore a garment of camel's hair and a leather belt uh, around his waist, and his food was locust and wild honey. So this is crazy dude, right? I mean, he's, this wasn't actually how everybody, you know, dressed and walked around. Uh, then Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region about the Jordan were going out to him, and they were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. But when he saw many of his Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, you brood of vipers, who warned you, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruit in keeping with repentance and do not presume to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children from Abraham. He says, you are not entitled. John the Baptist hurt some feelings. The Jews thought that they were right with God basically because of their birthright. That's what he's dealing with. And John's baptism was one of repentance, which was calling on his people to say they weren't right. They were not right with God. So did he have, did John the Baptist have the right to assert such? Who's he think he is talking to them? And inquiring minds wanted to know if he had the right to be making these claims, these statements, and baptizing. So, so the Jews sent some folks to go check him out. So we turn to John chapter 1, verses 19 and 20. We read, and it says this, and this is the testimony of John. When the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, who are you? He confessed and did not deny, but confessed, 
I am not the Christ. And before the court of public opinion, we have this first testimony, the, the record, the witness of John. Now, how important is this truth of a witness? God knows that is extremely important, and that's why he has John write this. You see, God wants you to know that this stuff is to be trusted. The gospel of John gives special attention to eyewitnesses, those who have seen and heard Jesus and can give a firsthand testimony. John the Baptist is one of them, but there are many others that we're going to read about. The Samaritan woman testifies to her community. The man born blind testifies before the antagonistic Jewish authorities. And then Mary Magdalene, uh, the first eyewitness to Jesus' resurrection, uh, testifies to the disciples. And the disciples are appointed to testify before the hostile world because they have been eyewitnesses from the beginning. They lived and with them. They, went, they did, built campfires with them. They did all that. They knew the real Jesus, and they shared that with us. And finally, John's gospel that we're reading is recommended as a trustworthy account of Jesus' life since it is based on the eyewitness testimony of John himself. Now, the Jews, they sent priests and Levites from the big city, Jerusalem, to, to see, John the, see if John the Baptist was the Messiah. And before we get any further, let me, the term the Jews, we use that term a lot. The, ter, the, the term that Jews is used, it, actually it's used by John himself, and, and John was a Jew, and, and it's used 71 times by him and only 17 times in the other three Gospels. So John uses that term. It's not a racist term. In this case, the Jews refer to Jewish established, Jewish religious establishment. Who are the ones that were usually antagonistic towards the gospel and their Jewish Messiah. So John lets them have it, I say, 71 times in his gospel. And so John, he, he, again, he often uses that word to reflect the hostility and rejection of Jesus by these Jewish leaders who saw Jesus as a threat to their authority and power, right? If he becomes king, what are we? I mean, let's just look at what it really gets down to. As far as the Levites go, both of John's parents were from the tribe of Levi. So John the Baptist was a Levite. And so note this, that, that John, it's good for us to notice, John could have comfortably assumed the role of priest, like his father, rather the unconventional role that God, his heavenly father, called him to do. So which one will you do? The priests were, well, instead, John the Baptist, he obeyed God's direct call on his life, which cost him his life. Now, the priests, they were the human go-betweens go between God and man, and they, they performed the religious ceremonies, they were, the, they were the theological influencers over Israel. And when they're not serving in the temple for their two-week annual duty, they, they lived scattered in the, the land as religious experts. And they wielded a lot of power in their religiously dominated culture. See, so they felt like if anything religious was going on, in the neighborhood or in the region, they should be notified, right? The Levites served alongside the priest in the temple rituals. Uh, in addition, many of the Levites served on the temple police force. So they would have served as bodyguards or security for the priests when they went out in public. Now, these men, uh, these men sent out by other men Flat out, flat out asked John, who are you? And clearly, clearly he was enough of a somebody for them to go check it out. So this gives evidence 
that they were indeed, they were on the lookout for the Messiah. Everything that was written, they were looking out for the Messiah and were sensitive to what was going on around the country, even in remote areas. So they sent some people out there. I mean, could this be the Messiah or a link to the Messiah? So we, so we have a, a God-sent man interrogated by men sent by other men. I think we often forget who, as Christians, we have in our corner. If God's called you, like these guys that just went to Trinidad, if God has called you to go and do that, then you got God on your side. Oh, it's scary. Ah, well, if, if God's called you to do it, he will empower you. So John belongs to God who sent him out. John is commissioned by God to go. John possesses all the authority and power of the God who sent him out. John is God's witness for his son Jesus. His, his answer is intriguing if you, if you take it slow and break it down. And, and I talked to you all last week about reading it slow so you, you really get what's in it. They, they didn't ask him. They didn't ask him if he was the Messiah but that's what he responds to. And in a unique way, that gets lost in speed reading. And sometimes I try not to do it. I talk to some other day. I try not to do these Greek things on you. But, you know, just, but in the Greek, it is, it is pretty cool. There's, there's a phrase that Jesus uses over and over, quoted by the Apostle John, ego I me, which means I am, which is pretty heavy. And we'll talk about that a lot when we, as we go through John. But John the ba Baptist answers their question, ego uk ami. He says, I am not. Of course, he says, I'm not the Christ. But again, on more than one occasion, Jesus said, I am. He is. You know some of those. I am the good shepherd. I am the way, the truth, and life. I'm the door. I'm the living water, I'm the bread of life, all of those. In verses, verse 21, and they asked him, what then? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? He answered, no. They said to him, well, who are you? We need to give an answer to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? He said, I'm the voice of one crying out in the wilderness. Make straight the pathway of the Lord as the prophet Isaiah said. They pushed further for an answer to his identity. They, they knew that they couldn't go back to the powers to be with no answer. They weren't going to take, oh, we don't know. They weren't going to take that. He was obviously Messiah worthy for consideration in somebody's opinion back in Jerusalem for them to even send a delegation. Or that, I don't know. Or they were just going through the motions. I, I don't know. Historically, first century Jews were looking for one of three people to come on the scene. The Messiah, Elijah the prophet, and the prophet like Moses. And John's appearance, I mean, it came out of nowhere. And a lot of people were wondering whether he was one of these three. So a lot of noise is going on, a lot of rackets going on. People are coming down the Jordan River. He's telling them repent and they're baptized and all this. I mean, it's a big to do. And so he further answers that he is not Elijah or the prophet. And there's no bragging going on here. John, John was not seeking his own glory. John, John, in fact, did not recognize himself as Elijah or even an Elijah type character. He said no to that, right? But in Matthew eleven fourteen, 14, Jesus said he, he was. Who was right, him or Jesus? Hey, I'll let you. Yeah, okay. But it just shows he wasn't thinking highly of himself. He didn't go, I'm the Elijah guy. <laughs> Jesus had to do that. Listen, if God's going to tell you, if God's going to say you're somebody, you let him do it, right? John was just doing as he was told. Meanwhile, he was fulfilling a prophecy, Malachi 3.1. 
Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me, and the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple, and the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight, behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. So there's one of those things in the Old Testament that's tell us, look for him, there's a messenger going to be coming to prepare the way. They're pressing him, and he answers with the word of God. Uh, Isaiah 43, verse 3, he says, A voice cries in the wilderness, prepare, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for God. So another prophecy, 700 years before it happens. In turn, he was saying, I am the a voice crying out in the wilderness. And I, I, I guess tell you, this, this kind of struck me. I, I, this voice, a voice crying out in the wilderness. Nobody else at this time was crying out about the lack of relationship with God. They were going about their Jewish religious business without relationship with God. It'd be like us doing church without a relationship with him. Can that happen? Oh, it happens all the time. Matthew, Mark, and Luke knew about the one crying out in the wilderness, and they wrote about this. And, and his father, Zacharias, also knew, John the Baptist's father, also knew that he was the one preparing the way, Luke 176. You see, the nation of Israel had been 400 years, oh, probably over 400 years, without hearing a word from God. These were people who were accustomed to God speaking to one of their prophets and their prophets speaking to them from God. God speaks to him, he speaks to them, and God said, y'all ain't listening. And he, Amos 8, 11, he said, I'm going to give you a famine of the word of God. And he stopped talking to them. What do you think not talking to someone does to a relationship? Somebody needed to be crying because they were in a spiritual dead zone. Their dead religiosity was devoid of a living relationship with the living God. If you were just going to church, coming, sitting down, shutting up, singing, throwing some money in there, getting up, leaving, and that's that, then that's a dead relationship you're just doing church and that's what the jews were doing for over 400 years they were doing all the rituals and this and that and all that. they had all that down but no relationship that's why he came to the neighborhood are you getting any of this you see it it, it is cold heartless religion versus heartfelt relationship. You miss the person in relationship, not in the rituals. So there's this broken relationship and broken relationships hurt and we cry. Their relationship with God was worse than stale. It was dead. The people, not the Jews, not the Jewish establishment, religious establishment, the people were hungering and thirsting for a word from God, any word. And then John comes. 
But they weren't prepared. They were, they, were, they were prepared. You don't go, you don't just get into that relationship, do you? They weren't prepared for that relationship. They, they weren't. And so a little something, something was going on over in Bethany. The religious leaders in Jerusalem heard, and they sent some folks to check it out. And they also uh, asked him if he was the prophet. And so God had told Moses that someday he would send another prophet to Israel and, and that's Deuteronomy 18, 18. And I will put my words in his mouth. He will tell them everything I command him. So God is going to send somebody. And Jesus was the prophet who fulfilled that prophecy. Uh, in Acts 3, 22, Acts 7, 37, Jesus fulfills all the requirements for a prophet in title, word, and deed. He is the ultimate prophet in that he is the very Word of God himself, he is the Word. Not common knowledge to us, but the Jews had always understood that this prophecy would one day be fulfilled by the coming of the prophet who would either come just before Messiah or would in fact be the Messiah. And this helps understand the conversation between the Jews and John the Baptist. They had a clue that a guy like this would come before the Messiah. And it was their job. These religious guys that sent people, it was their job to be on the lookout. It was their job to go, yeah, that's him. All right, y'all, let's get together. I don't know what they're thinking. Verse 24 to 28. Now, they had been sent from the Pharisees. They asked him then, why are you baptizing if you're neither the Christ nor Elijah nor the prophet? John answered them, I baptize with water, but among you, right up in here, stands one you do not know, even he who comes after me, the strap of whose sandal I'm not worthy to untie. These things took place in Bethany across the Jordan where John was baptizing. So they, they seemingly ignored his claim to be the voice of one crying in the wilderness and that alone being enough to justify his baptizing. So they ask, who in the world do you think you are? Where did you get the right to baptize since you're not the Christ or Elijah or the prophet? You know, they, they just moved right past his voice, that I'm the voice comment. He, they, he said it. He said it. They just like moved right on past the voice comment or they did not interpret this, his claim to be the voice as authoritative. And mostly probably because they thought they had all the authority. And prior to John's time, Jews would baptize Gentiles who wanted to convert to Judaism. But these Jews felt John was, he was treating the Jews like they were sinners. How dare him? So the Jews, they felt above that. I mean, it's okay you do that to a Gentile. We know they're a sinner, right? But the Jews felt above that, so they, they thought as later a Pharisee would be told by Jesus, you need to be born again. So the very, so the very thought of Jewish baptism was insane. They couldn't wrap their mind around that and an affront to them, for they were God's people. But here... They were checking it out because a lot of folks were getting baptized. Something was happening here. I mean, whatever. It was not a small thing. And in Matthew 3, 11, we read that John, John the Baptist mentions the purpose of his baptisms. He says, I baptize you with water for repentance. So he's trying to get them to, to turn from sin. He's trying to get some hearts ready for Jesus He's just cutting up some soil, right? He's getting ready. He was getting them ready to turn from sin to Christ. Paul affirms this in Acts chapter 19, verse 4. John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. He, he told the people to believe in the one coming after him that is in Jesus. John's baptism had to do with repentance. It was a symbolic representation of changing one's mind and going a new direction. Confessing their sins, they were baptized by him in the Jordan River. Being baptized by John 
demonstrated, first of all, recognition of one's sin. Secondly, a desire for spiritual cleansing. And thirdly, a commitment to follow God's law in anticipation of the Messiah's arrival. See, they didn't know he was there yet. So they were doing that anticipating his arrival. The Jews were more concerned with authority, theirs, than the truth. There may be some here even today that you're more concerned about something else, what's going to happen in the next couple hours, than the truth. John's response is not to explain his authority to baptize. Rather, as the forerunner, paving the way, he, he points these blind leaders to the Messiah of whom he had been called and ordered by God to bear witness. His job was to introduce them to Jesus. Newsflash, he tells them. There's, he says, there's one stand. There's one standing among you. So I don't know how many were there at this time, but he said, there's one standing among you. He's the one you need to be asking all these questions to. I'm a nobody. He's here standing among you. I'm not worthy even to untie his shoes. Evidently, he, he let them soak that one in until the next day. It, it kept them around at least. Uh, evidently, he, uh, well, so we see, well, we see the, in this moment, we see this thickness in the spiritual atmosphere, if you will, and, and they're looking. They're in search for answers. But my question is, this, are they really listening? Because he's already gave them some hints. Are they really listening? You know, made up minds, that's the worst person to talk to. Somebody's got a made up mind. They, it doesn't matter. Right? I will talk to anybody about Jesus if they listen. They don't want to hear it. I ain't got time for that either. If you don't want to hear it, I ain't got time for it. John the Baptist, he's got their attention, and then we go to the next day. Verse 29, it says, The next day he saw Jesus coming toward him, and he said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who ranks before me, because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but for this purpose I came baptizing with water that he might be revealed to Israel. And John bore witness. I saw the Spirit descended from heaven like a dove, and it rem remained on him. I myself did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, He's on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain. This is he who baptizes with the Spirit, Holy Spirit. And I have seen and I have borne witness that this is the Son of God. So Jesus, Jesus walks near and John points him out as the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. I don't know what else we want to have here, right? We've got the writings that talk about it. We've got these dreams. We've got the pregnant woman that had the baby. We got the, had the nine months waiting and going on dreams and visions. And, and then here he is pointing them out. I mean, a testimony doesn't get any better than him standing in the dirt, standing in the dirt, pointing to another man that's standing in the dirt and says, that's him. That is the Lamb of God right there. I mean, you hear what I'm saying? You hear what I'm saying? He was physically right there. See, there's a, there's a verbal testimony I could tell you about something. There, there's a, a written testimony I could write about something, right? There's a sketch. I could draw you a sketch. But we're talking about in living color. He said, there he is right there. I mean, I don't know, 15 feet away, 20 feet away. He's pointing them out, the Lamb of God. How'd they miss that? God's like, what, what, what do you want? What? I tell you what, I'll come down here. I'll tell you it's going to happen. I'll have somebody point me out. And we, I've told you, the whole Old Testament points to Jesus. He calls them the Lamb of God. Exodus chapter 12, the Passover Lamb. Jesus is the Lamb. So John, John is just a witness 
pointing him out. That's all he is. He has come to do the work of taking away the sin of the world, he says. John's purpose is shallow in comparison. His purpose was to baptize people for repentance of sins, but more importantly than that, his baptizing would reveal Jesus to Israel. John's testimony was wrought with more detail. John tells of how God, who called him to this task of being the forerunner, let him know who Jesus was at his baptism. You see, John saw the dove descending on Jesus, and he, and he heard the voice of the Father saying, this is him, this is the Son, and, and God let him know ahead of time so that he on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain this is he who baptized with the Holy Spirit. So God told John and John told the people. I don't know what they're looking for in a Messiah. I don't know what the people today are looking for in a Messiah. What do we want? We want somebody to heal us? What do we want? Somebody just to that'll pay our debts? What, what, what are we looking for in a Messiah? But God knows what the world needs in a Messiah. He knows that the world needs to be saved from sin. And he knows that it will take a perfect sacrifice. Enter the Lamb of God. And he knows that the world needs verifiable witnesses, so he gives us those. Anyone that goes to hell will trip over the gospel on their way in there. You will have to trip over this great big story about one who came from heaven, died, terrible death, wrong, illegal rest, all that, and was resurrected. You've got to trip over that story to get in hell. The Apostle John brings the testimony of John to the forefront so that reading about it, many would believe. He was there. He had an encounter with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. God had set him apart to point out Jesus. With this testimony. Will we believe? And if we do believe, will we share this testimony? He was a worthy witness who went to his death telling the truth. He was the guy that had it made in the shade if he just kept his day job. He had it. He didn't need this. So there's your witness. I have seen and I have borne witness that this is the Son of God. Jesus is God. My question to you this morning is, have you accepted the testimony? And what are you doing to clear the path for somebody else to accept the testimony, to meet Jesus? And because it's about relationships, more importantly, who are you, who are you clearing the path for to know that Jesus is the Son of God? Now is that time where you just take your next step. And that step could be anything from saying, today I surrender. I've heard this story so many times and I've ran, from, you know, I've run from it. But today is the day that I surrender my life to Jesus Christ. I believe, I believe, I get it. I see John wrote this, I believe. In fact, you're saying, you know, you started in John, I've, been read, I've read ahead. That's okay, you can read ahead. And I see it. The testimonies are all in that gospel of John, person after person. I mean, we'll get to John chapter 4, one of my favorites. Yeah, I say favorites, right? There's always so many favorites, so many stinking favorites. But I used to couldn't even read John chapter 4 when, when, when Jesus is going to get me again. Okay. Uh, you know, just when he runs into a Samaritan woman. And... and, and and she says, I, I know all that. He says, yeah, but when the one that's supposed to come, to, he'll tell us all about that. 
And Jesus says, oh, I'm in. I just, my, my prayer would be for everyone in here to get this. Not, not be stubborn about it. Hold, now, what are you holding out for? You've tried life on your own and you're doing not that good at it. All right? And God laid it all out. He wrote it down. Here it is. Oh, and I'm going to send a guy to tell you that the guy is coming. I mean, he didn't skip any steps. And even today, even today, the Holy Spirit is in here telling you that's what you need to do. You need to do that right now. So I invite you to respond however God is speaking. You know, I invite you to all stand. Maybe some could come up here and pray for others. If you're a Christian, if you're a follower of Jesus, you need to be praying for others in here that may need to make that decision today. Maybe it's your next step for baptism. You're like, you've come up with all these excuses why you don't want to follow, let other people know you've been saved by following in baptism. Well, that's pitiful. You know, all that God has done for us, you should do that now. And maybe it's whatever that next step is. I'm, I'm not going to put stuff in your mouth. You know what to do. Just do that.